Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Podiatric Dermatology Monthly Wrap-Up. You are here with myself, Stephanie, and my co-host, Joseph. Um, Hi, Steph. <laughs> we've got a lovely little show today. Um, we're going to be discussing um, a heel wound case first up, which um, is really interesting. Um, and for our dermatosis today, we're going to be looking at stasis dermatitis. And following up that, we're going to have a little product chat about ichthymol. Mm -hmm. Quite oh. the uh, quite the uh, uh, round table discussion because we're dealing with something round to begin with. It sound like the introduction to play school? Oh, that was a really bad dad joke. I know. I'm sorry. There's there's plenty more where that came from. Uh, yeah. So to start things off, for those of us that are watching us uh, on YouTube. Uh, we had an interesting case from a podiatrist by the name of Jess. Thanks so much for sharing, Jess. It's quite an interesting case. Um, it was actually a post-op heel wound of uh, someone that had a melanoma removed. And heel wounds are a little bit interesting. Um, what's what's your experience been with heel wounds, Steph? You do quite a bit of them, I imagine. I do. Um, we do not like heel wounds in our department. They can be terrifying. Really difficult to treat if you don't have full patient buy-in um you know because all of your weight is going to your heel with every step you take uh unless you're a toe walker <laughs> um it's very very difficult to get people to comply with regimes um to heal heal wounds um mm. and if they start going bad it's really hard to turn them around you know if you have a toe wound or a forefoot wound that starts going south you know, worst case scenario, you can end up with a transmit amputation. But if it's a heel wound and you can't get it back on track, you're looking at a below move, which mm. has significant implications for your patient, not just in terms of morbidity, but their quality of life. So, yeah, mm. we have a very healthy uh, fear and respect of heel wounds. Um, and we really try to get on top of them very quickly. So, mm. seeing this case was really interesting. Um, Conjures up, con conjures up quite a few <laughs> obvious uh, clinical pathways. For me, the interesting aspect of heel wounds and just plantar wounds in general is that um, intersection between biomechanics and dermatology. And I think that's what makes podiatry unique in the sense that we have to consider not just the actual wound management, the skin management, the dermatological aspects, but also the mechanical aspects. So we need to start thinking about footwear, orthotics, cushioning padding uh, the dressings themselves how well they'll adhere with you know high pressure and friction areas so number of considerations for something like this i should also uh, point out that steph works in a high-risk foot clinic so she sees the worst of the worst so hence the healthy fear and respect <laughs> for... yeah i really do and i i really um respect jess actually for submitting this case um this is something quite confronting to come across in private podiatry if this is not in your wheelhouse mm -hmm. um and yeah kudos to her for popping it on there and she had some really great starting points of what she was going to do for this patient mm. um i think just a couple of significant um facts from the case was um this is two years post skin graft yes um and obviously it's difficult when you are seeing a patient that long after the fact um trying to piece together what's happened before and um in my experience Unfortunately, it's quite often there's not a great deal of solid aftercare with these particular procedures. Um, you know, they might get reviewed once or twice and then mm. they're released back out to a podiatrist. And that was the case with this lady, but it was sort of like two years post. She wasn't happy with how things were going. She was getting lateral ankle pain because she was trying to stay off the medial heel. Um, and the specialist basically just said to her, I can't do any more for you. You need to see a podiatrist. Yeah. Which I would argue is far too late to be referring to a podiatrist when you're two years post and you're looking at a graph like this. Correct. Correct. And, and surgeons, uh, I mean, we, we, we need to be careful how we, how we word this because we are, are all part of um, a healthcare team, but in terms of post-op complications from a wound perspective, surgeons, it's not really their forte. And mm. I've had a number of cases of uh, whether it's grafts or whether it's Achilles repair or, or other sort of tricky biomechanical type things, often that's where some surgeons might have difficulty seeing that 
um, that mechanical and, and footwear element to it. And, and, and that's where being part of a broader team uh, within healthcare does make a big difference. But uh, you know, yeah. we love our surgeons, um, but we also know that they are incredibly overloaded. Um, Correct. You know, and so they're, they're in the trenches. Um, and so the follow-up care is sometimes not as optimal as it could be. Um, and, and that's why it is so important to have, you know, orthopedics or, or podiatric surgeons who work in closely with a network of either public or private podiatrists for that follow-up care. Um, and that's something that, in my experience, is not always done particularly well. Correct. Correct. We're all, and if we all pull in the same direction, we can fix a lot more problems. Mm. Um, I wanted to know your thoughts, Steph, on drying out a heel wound, creating an S scar with betadine. Mm. Somewhat in vogue, uh, we had a discussion about it a few months back um, where we were looking at the evidence and the evidence uh, <laughs> in typical evidence uh, based research fashion is inconclusive and we need more research. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I've, I, I have to say it's a bit of a mixed bag um, for my, in, in my own experience. In some cases, it's been wonderful. So for those that, that are unaware, there is a, um, a method of, of fixing up some pressure wounds where the source of pressure has been removed, whereby betadine or a liquid iodine is painted on once or twice daily to create a big scab, also known as an eschar. And then eventually what happens is the base of the wound sloughs off that scab and then you're left with a healed area. So, Steph, your thoughts? Oh. It's really <laughs> nervous. Well, sorry, um, what, what was that? I didn't catch that. It makes me really nervous. Um, we work in with a vascular department who really love this method and um, often times, you know, if uh, we have patients who have been revascularized and there's kind of nothing more that we can do, it's literally just paint it with betadine, you know, up to four times a day sometimes. Uh, wow. And very nice that leave it open. Um, and so, of course, you know, yeah, the evidence is there for some of that sometimes to work. However, um, my instinct is, you know, I want to keep things covered. I want to stop any more bugs from going in there. And uh, if they're in, you know, a home environment where they're getting up and shuffling about the house and going outside and doing some gardening and you've got an uncovered wound that you're just painting with betadine, mm -hmm. um, I feel like in my experience, it just speeds up the process of um, secondary cellulitis or uh, a progression of that wound if you're not adequately covering and managing any exudate because it's not going to dry everything out mm. some wounds it's fantastic for you know small toe wounds or something that are just constantly sloppy and you really just want to dry that right out um i'd be really nervous of using it on a heel wound this size mm. yeah i mean when it comes to wound healing sometimes you need um a perspective on on where the wound's headed and if you can't see the base you don't know where it's healing from yeah. and 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 it's difficult to track it's just i mean what would your note say or what would your picture capture it's it's... still in place correct yeah. yes continue QID. on yeah, Q yeah. qid i mean it's edges you can't yeah. see what's happening underneath it's a nightmare it's, yeah. it's difficult but um I, I think the take home message is when it comes to dealing with any plantar wound not only do we need a team approach not only do we need a healthy understanding of biomechanics as well as dermatology but we also need to individualize our treatment so um look at the um look at the patient in their context look at the whole not the whole terrible another dad joke but uh it's a good one and it's <laughs> Something. One though. <laughs> well, uh, maybe we'll let the viewers decide that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> moving on to our next uh, topic of discussion, Steph. Uh, what what pops into your head when you see this? Mm, that's an unhappy leg. <laughs> what what symptoms do you think this would uh, present? Uh, this is one of those lovely cases. I actually had a patient come in one day and say, "Look, you know, my legs have been bad for a while, but they feel really hard." They've suddenly, they, they're feeling really hard. And so I gave it a feel and there's that typical woody, you know, the tissue is firming up um, and yeah. Dare I give it away? Stasis dermatitis. Stasis dermatitis, AKA venous eczema, AKA gravitational eczema, which makes it sound like something out of this world. But in short, it is the end uh, consequence and often the middle consequence actually of venous disease. 
So what happens on a, a tissue level is uh, veins themselves lack the um, the muscle to pump uh, uh, deoxygenated blood back up to the heart where it needs to be recirculated. Arteries obviously have the, the muscle around it. That's why you can feel an artery, but veins don't. And so veins rely on uh, a series of valves as well as just normal uh, movements. So standing, walking, jumping, and dancing, et cetera. But what happens is when those valves wear out and when people exercise less, the blood tends to pull. And so it leads to edema. And um, when uh, too much blood is pooling in the deep veins, the blood gets then pushed out to the superficial areas until eventually that blood and, and all those capillaries and veins and venules start to leak out blood into the superficial tissues, into the dermis, and, and even in some cases into the epidermis, which results in an eczema type reaction because the blood is not where it's meant to be. And so in, in essence, you get an innate inflammatory immune response. So it's eczema that's driven internally by um, vascular disruption. So it's, it's quite an interesting process. What's interesting about- a really good explanation for us healthcare professionals. <laughs> I'm going to put this to you because I have a lot of elderly patients who don't understand why they're wearing compression. Mm. They hate it. They don't want to use it. And understandably so. Uh, however, I find myself each week having to go over why I'm reapplying their stockings for them after their treatment. Um, you know, why I'm helping them to get into this compression because they don't understand or they'll say, you know, I keep getting these like really superficial wounds on my legs and mm. they're uncomfortable and, or, you know, they'll sit in my chair and they get up and there's just fluid, you know, just to be disgusting as our profession is, you know, you're wiping <laughs> the, the exudate off your chair at the end because there's nowhere else for this fluid to go. It has to come out somehow. Exactly. And exactly. it's not being brought back into the system. So um, I have my own way of explaining it to them, but I would really like to hear your okay. friendly version, Joseph, because I like right. to take home for me with things like this. I really like hearing how sure. other people explain things to patients. Okay. So how I explain it to the patients is um, blood is supposed to stay inside of the vessels, but what happens is, when some when, when the vessels don't always work properly, some of that blood leaks out. And so by us helping the vessels achieve what they're meant to achieve, which is to circulate the blood, then we can prevent skin problems as well as um, other problems. And so that's why by wearing a compression sleeve, we're helping that circulation move around efficiently and preventing issues. Hmm. I, I mean... Then you can go off onto lots of tangents and you can talk about things like hemosiderosis and venous insufficiency and et cetera, et cetera. And but watch them glaze over. Correct, correct. But normally keeping it simple, if you if you explain to them the basic um pathophysiology and, and physiological mechanisms of it, and you also give them uh, a vision of what can go wrong as well. <laughs> Yeah. Fear and respect seems to be another theme that uh, is popping up throughout this episode. But uh, Steph, uh, briefly, what do you tell your patients in regard to their compression therapy? I tend to make it really basic. And I just say, look, your veins are, you know, the valves in your veins are not working the way that they used to. And they're allowing fluid to leak out into the tissues around it. So instead of your veins pumping that blood back up and recirculating, it's just getting stuck and it's cooling. And that's why you have this swelling and that's why you have this leaking of your skin and the compression helps to kind of keep everything together and help those valves to really push it through, you know? Um, and that's about as far as I go, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, I yep. also then say to them as well, you know, and the benefit of well, as well of, of having your compression on is that you've got an extra layer. So if you're getting out of the taxi and you, you know, bump your leg on the door, um, it's not going to be as big of a wound as if you were just doing that on bare skin. So that it's protective in more mm. ways. Very clever. Very clever. I will use that. Plus they, they, they're a super fashion item as well in, in oh, most, you know, totally. I wear compression socks. I don't know. You know, <laughs> I, I actually that's really helpful. So I have um, long COVID and as I you know, got jammed with COVID three times last year, which was super fun. Um, and my doctor's recommendation was to wear compression socks on the longer days that I have. And it's really helped. Um, 
so much so that I, I recommend it to most of my patients who are on their feet a lot mm. these days as well. It's a, just a light compression. It doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to be wrestling to get it on your legs. Um, but I really see that kind of light go in my patient's eyes when they go, oh, like you're wearing them as well. And I was like, look, but, you know, they're not going to win any fashion awards, but <laughs> I feel great at the end of the day and I don't really care. So Correct. Less tired feet, less yeah. tired feet and legs as well. Yeah. Um, and on a similar vein, uh, pun intended, uh, as we wrap things up, I know we, 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 well today. we, we need to do like a little counter dad joke. Like we need a bell. Ding, ding, ding. Uh, I, I, I've got, I, I've got some creams in my hand, Steph. What do you reckon these are? <laughs> yes. We love a good ego derm, not to, uh, put a brand out there, no, but of course. Ichthamol. And what does it do, Joseph? Ichthamol, also known as, wait for it, ammonium bituminosulfate, Ooh. is um, a naturally derived um, crude oil um, byproduct. So it's um, it's got a bit of a tar type smell. Um, yeah, if you find yourself, you know, enjoying the smell of roadworks, then this oof, is the absolutely. Um, and uh, essentially, in short, it's a um, an anti-inflammatory. It also has mild uh, bactericidal and fungicidal properties, so it does kill bugs, but it's really helpful in eczema. So you could actually use it in the case that we described previously in venous eczema. You can also use it on psoriasis. Um, and um, there's two different iterations of it that are available over the counter. The cream version um, is just good old plain ichthamol in a moisturizing base, whereas the ointment version actually has zinc oxide in it. And we know that zinc has a number of uh, properties. What's interesting about it is, and I'm gonna go a little bit technical here, uh, before we end off the episode, um, eczema in particular tends to form vesicles, which work their way up through the epidermis and the dermis in a process called spongiosis. Um, Ichthamol is really good at, at drawing out all of those little vesicles. So it sort of accelerates the eczema in a sense in order to heal it. So um, the itch and the irritation from eczema can be from those gaps in the skin. So ichthamol being a drawing agent, it draws out those gaps and helps the skin remain one nice integrated organ, which is the ultimate purpose of what the skin is. You know, we want we we want the skin to be a a, a nice tight junction. Hmm. Okay. Have you ever used ichthamol on your patients or recommended it, Steph? Um, well, funnily enough, my uh, old boss used to recommend uh, a home concoction of uh, zinc oxide. He would send his patients to get. Uh, essentially like Vaseline and the pamphlet and mix that together for venous stasis uh, eczema so, and dermatitis. Um, so, I mean, it's missing the ichthamol element. But... Yeah, he could have he could have just bought this and chucked some Vaseline <laughs> on top. <laughs> I think we were in a very low socioeconomic area, so it was like, get what you can get. Absolutely. Um, which, and it used to help, which is great. Um, yeah, I've, I've used it personally as well uh, when I get uh, irritation. I wear an N95 mask going back to the COVID, uh, I just don't trust anyone. So I wear my N95 uh, every day that I'm practicing. And so I, I, I will get irritation around my chin and, and my kind of mouth area uh, if I'm not careful. So if I get particular flares of that, I'll use this to just calm everything down a little bit. And I'm I'm not an eczema sufferer, um, but it's I find it very, very helpful. Mm. It's a wonderful product. And also um, as an alternative and a steroid sparing agent, it can be really helpful. And we can talk about this in another episode, but rotational therapy with chronic dermatoses can be really, really effective, which um, in essence is rotating between a number of different products in order to achieve um, uh, therapeutic outcomes because the body can develop tolerance to one particular treatment. So yeah, um, I hope you found that interesting. Any final uh, comments before we wrap this episode up for the month? No, I'm really happy with that. And we've got some uh, really exciting content coming for the next month. And uh, yeah, I think um, it's going quite well at the moment. So if you have any uh, suggestions or things that you would like us to talk about in a little more detail, you're always welcome to drop some comments. Uh, however you're listening, you can contact us through the um, Pediatric Dermatology Interest Group or PDIG uh, and also through YouTube as well. Excellent. Thanks, Steph. Uh, hopefully, uh, next episode we'll nail it. Dad joke and a preview right there all together. <laughs> There's that next dad joke. Oh, Ding! God. All right. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Until time next go. time. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.